shopping for everyone on my list, including Oda on Ethel, who I only ever see at Christmas. <laughs>
And if you wouldn't mind just taking that out and starting to fill that out, uh, or at least being prepared to fill that out, uh, after Greg's message, when he comes through, the, the offering plates will come by, offering bags will come by, and we'll just ask that you shove those uh, commitment cards or, or comment cards into the offering bags. So you don't have to start worrying about that now, but start thinking ahead what you want to write. Uh, we, we take prayer requests. We do all kinds of stuff. It's a way for you to communicate with us in leadership and on staff. And so we really value your, your input and, and everything that you have to say. So please do that. Uh, Greg, did I miss anything? No. Great. The voice from behind the green curtain. Pay <laughs> attention. The great Oz. Well, let's stand together and pray, and then we're going to get started this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for these people. Thank you for the awesome gifts that you have given us. And uh, Father, even though there's so many things that we want and think that we need, God, I pray that we would turn our focus to you this morning. Uh, and that we would prepare ourselves for the coming of your son, Jesus. Let us do that together with us. And do that with each other, God. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.
churches are uh, doing what they call Advent. Basically, what Advent means uh, is it means uh, welcoming or, or coming or arriving, and and talks specifically to the arriving of Jesus, the Christ Child, our Savior, the one who we're singing about, and. There's a lot of great songs out there that you know kind of tie into this, but uh, it doesn't get any more uh, apparent or obvious than singing about "Here is our King, Here is the Coming of our King." So when we sing that together, I just I really enjoy uh, the community that is built that way. And we're, we're here this morning. This is something that is obviously important to us, you know, whether we know it or not. We're here for a purpose. And um, I believe this morning is to proclaim together that we, as a community, need Jesus. And so, I just want want you to think about that. That's something I think about a lot. But I I just want to put that in your brain as we keep going this morning and, and, uh, and sing this song, Here's Our King.
lots of fun. Okay. Great. I, I think that's probably true. It's certainly true for me. But is this also maybe a kind of time of year where there's some stress that goes along with it? I mean, all this Christmas hype and everything to get ready creates a little bit of an issue for us. Kind of we're testing it out. I, I did a rather informal poll just by talking to people, and we put something on our website as well to ask people, what's your biggest Christmas stress? And it was interesting, the results. Um, the biggest one was that it's too expensive. After that, the second biggest stress was family. And the third was preparation pressure. All that stuff, you know, that goes along with getting ready and all the obligations and the tinsel and all that kind of stuff. You know, so we thought, well, you know, we can do something with that. I mean, that's what the Bible, when we start understanding what God intended when God gave us Jesus so that Christmas would be something that we observe, it has a lot to help us keep all those sorts of things in balance. So, you know, we don't have that discussion. And uh, that's what we want to talk to you about today. Because, you know, we aren't getting ready at this time of year to celebrate the big party of Christmas. What we are getting ready is our hearts and our lives to receive Jesus, to receive that Christ child coming to us. And so there's something that we can learn about all of that. You know, uh, this week we're focusing on those Christmas gifts, all those presents. And, you know, and I'm like everybody else. I want this one, you know? <laughs> These great big things. I remember so well as a child, I was the youngest of five kids, and my parents didn't have a lot of money, but they really did Christmas nicely for us. And we had lots of presents under the tree, they made sure they were wrapped under the tree early, and we kids, I mean, we scouted out that tree so carefully. We knew exactly how many presents each one of us had, we knew who had the biggest, who had the heaviest, for some reason the heavy was important. I knew I had uh, gone through my presents to try to figure out which ones were probably closed because I wanted to open those up first and kind of get them out of the way to, you know, save the neat stuff for last. Um, I, I love Christmas. I love Christmas gifts, so don't worry. You know, we're not going to try to take away Christmas gifts from you. You shouldn't be doing that. No, you know, because it's simply true that Christmas and gifts go together. In fact, if you want to follow along, uh, if on the back of your... Um, Sunday paper, there's an outline that follows the message, and you might want to take that, there's a pen on your seat, you can fill things in, if you don't want to do that, you don't have to, you can just listen, but, um, and all the films will be up on the screen as well for you, but um, the truth is that Christmas and gifts do go together, but if for you, then it's kind of just got all mixed up and gotten carried away, well, this might resonate with you a little bit, you all know the story, uh, how the Grinch stole Christmas. Take a look at this from the most recent movie. Dad? Yeah? Doesn't this seem like a bit much? Yeah. This is what Christmas is all about. Don't you feel it? Merry Christmas! Thank you for coming. Merry Christmas! Don't forget to change! Another minute closer to Christmas! Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Oh, 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 yes. Oh,
keep people following God's word, he had started building shrines and temples to all the other little gods and deities from around that area. In fact, he even revived the practice of human sacrifices. That's how far off the track he was from God. And so God sent Isaiah to send no word. You would imagine with a guy this bad that the word that God sent to Isaiah was, you're a finished guy. I'm sorry, I gave you a chance. You're ahead of all my people. You have taken us so far astray that you are done for. These people are going to come after you and they're going to conquer you. And they, they were worried. Um, he was really worried because not only was Ephraim in the north trying to conquer them, but unsuccessfully so to this point, but he had just gotten news that Syria was joining forces with Ephraim to come and to conquer Judah. And so, in fact, the Bible tells us right before this prophecy that Ahaz and the people um, were so worried that they shook like the trees of the forest um, before the wind. But God doesn't come and tell them that. No, he sends Isaiah with this prophecy. In fact, he says, you know, I, Ahaz, I know it's hard for you to believe because you've never gotten to know me. You've never learned to trust me. It's hard to believe that I would not abandon you, that I would let you be conquered, that I would let my promises fall empty. So ask me for a sign, any sign you want. Make it as deep as you are, as high as heaven. In other words, make it as great as you want, and I will give you that sign so that you know I will not abandon you. Well, Ahaz says, you know, I can't do that. I can't put the Lord to the test. And then I love what, um, what God says back to Ahaz. He says, you know, isn't it enough that you weary people all the time? Do you have to come and weary me too? Okay, forget it then. The Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son, and shall call him Emmanuel. That's the promise he's going to give you. See, the promise... That God gave us. This is the first prophecy of Christmas. The first prophecy of Jesus coming into our world. God Himself coming into our world. And it's that promise that is given to us. It doesn't matter that Isaiah was not a good person. It doesn't matter that the crisis was huge. It doesn't matter what your life might be like right now. And how obedient or disobedient you might think you've been to God. How much you deserve it or you don't deserve it. How big the crises are. God has that promise in His kingdom. They have well. See, God's gift is Jesus. <laughs> now, God's gift is not Christmas. Right? I mean, that's sort of, I think, what we've forgotten. In fact, you could probably sum up everything we're going to talk about in these first three weeks by understanding the fact that, um, you know, Christmas is not the time to try to have all these celebrations and have lots of fun. And, oh, by the way, since there seems to be something missing, we'll see if we can't get Jesus in there somewhere. No, what we really need to be doing is starting this season by finding out what it means to let Christ be coming into our lives. And when we are doing that, and then we take all these traditions, the trees and the presents, and the tinsel and everything else, and the music and the parties, and we use them as decorations for Christ coming into our lives, suddenly they have a lot of meaning. Suddenly this time of year comes alive and gives us life. But we have a tendency to do it the other way around. And so what we want to do is look at what does it mean that God gave us this gift, Jesus. And what do we learn through that kind of gift giving? Well, God's gift teaches us a couple of things. First of all, that the joy um, of gifts is in the giving, not in the getting. The joy of gifts is in the giving of them, not in the getting. You can see right up here on the screen. Now, I think we kind of all know that's true, and we probably all can pull up that line from Jesus, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Actually, you'll never find that anywhere in the Gospels, but Paul, later on in, in his writings and his letters, quotes Jesus. So that's how we know of that phrase, but it is better to give than to receive. Okay, we also know that, and I think instinctively we kind of know it, but it is so profoundly true. Uh, let me tell you a story, this is a little bit complicated, but it was a man told a story about a little boy, and I heard this when I was a kid, right? I was about seven, eight, nine years old. And he was telling me about this little boy who was also about my age, who heard a story about another boy about my age, right? Kind of complicated. I'm a little boy here, story about a little boy here, story about a little boy, all right? I'll see if I can keep this unwoven. So that little boy on the end there, he's from a family that doesn't have much money at all, and his father is unemployed, and it's Christmas time. And so they're not going to be presents this year at their house. But that little boy was too young to really understand that, and he wanted a bike. He wanted a bike so badly that he just kept talking about it, hoping he'd get this bike for Christmas, and his parents didn't know what to do. Well, he had a big brother, a couple years older than him. His big brother just thought, 
Why? I wish my little brother could get that money. So what does he do? He spends months trying to find little odd jobs, get 50 cents here, a dollar there, and he does it. By the time Christmas comes, he has saved up enough money to buy his brother a bike. And he does. And so on Christmas Eve, when there's hardly anything under the tree, not even the parents knew this, he rolls in this bike for his little brother. Now, the little boy who heard this story, as soon as he heard it, he said something. He said, boy, I wish I... And I'm the third little boy listening. And I finished the sentence. I wish I had a brother like that. <laughs> I did have a brother. Not like that, though. <laughs> My brother just beat me up. You know, what's the big deal here? I wish I had a big brother like that. And so I said, you know, you don't have to finish it. I already know what he's going to say. He was going to say, I wish I had a brother like that. But no, you know what the little boy said? I wish I was a brother like that. Did that one ever get me? I did not see that coming. And you know what was so amazing is I knew that that was the best answer. You know, I don't mean that I had the wrong one. Like, there's a right answer and a wrong answer. Great, you know, you chose wise or unwisely. No, it's just I knew that was a better answer. And I wished, I wished I had answered that way. Because somewhere deep inside me, I knew it is better to give than to get. And I had missed it. And I knew that if I was really going to be happy in life, if I was going to have a meaningful life, I needed to understand that. And I wished that... I wanted to spend my life figuring out what it was going on in that one little boy's mind and in his heart that he would answer that question that way. Because next time it came to me, I wanted to answer the question that way. It is better to give than to get. Life is about giving, not about getting. The next thing that God teaches us in the way God gives the gift is that God gives gifts that make a difference. Gifts that make a difference. Now, um, Mary, who is the mother of this gift, Jesus, um, in Luke chapter 1, which is part of the Christmas story before Jesus is born, the story about Jesus being born is in Luke chapter 2, we have some of Mary's words. And when Mary finds out that she's going to be the, the, the mother of this gift of God to the world, she says here, you can see it um, on board, that... Um, the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is His name. He says, God has done great things for me. God has done things in my life that make a difference. That's what great things mean. Because God has made a difference in my life, I see God as holy. And what God is doing will make this a holy day, a holiday. Now, this is true in general. She goes on in, in that uh, song, we call it the Magnificat quite often. Um, and she talks about how God has taken the rich people down from the thrones and has filled the hunger of um, people that are hungry and has lifted up the lowly. God finds a way to give gifts that make a difference and we need to be about the same thing as well. Our traditions that have sprung up at Christmas and made Christmas so wonderful are traditions that people have discovered that they could give something. They could reach out to people where they could touch their lives and make a difference. And they didn't do it because they were going to be or could be repaid. In fact, the generosity that we know that has made Christmas Christmas is generosity that could never be repaid. See, Christmas isn't primarily a celebration for ourselves, but it's an opportunity, opportunity for us to make a difference in other people's lives. That's what it's all about. And it's really hard. Because in our lives, by and large, I think it's probably true for most of us sitting here, you know, the needs of our lives are so filled that we're really dealing with the wants of our lives, and it's very difficult to fill wants, because wants get bigger and bigger and bigger. And we've kind of glossed over the needs. That doesn't mean there aren't needs that aren't being met in each and every one of our lives, but we tend to be thinking wrong the wrong direction at Christmas time, and we have a hard time filling those. You know, how can you do that? How can you be making gifts that make a difference? Well, you know, one of the things is we have this alternative gift here. If you look inside your Sunday paper, you're going to find this single page. It's an alternative gift market. It's gifts that make a difference. These are gifts of anything from $1 to $80 that will provide water for a year or will give people an ability to get water to where they live, that will uh, provide them with lighting for a shelter and things like that all over the world. Places that you can make a difference um, in people's lives with simple and small gifts. $1 to $80 may make no difference in the lives of some of the people that are close to you. It can make an enormous difference to these people's lives. Um, 
Melissa and Deb have worked really hard on this. And by the way, Jacob's Wall gets absolutely nothing. In fact, this costs us something to put this on. But this is simply here for you to make it uh, uh, an alternative gift to people that can really make a difference. There's a table on it. Or you can um, contact us at any time to be about this. And you get a great card to go with it. So this can really be a, a gift that can make a difference in someone's life. So the idea is what? Instead of giving Uncle Harry the tie, you know he doesn't want you know, you can give him one of these and say, in your honor, I made a difference in someone's life in Africa. All right? Just one way of, it, of dealing with all that. You see, making a difference is different than impressing somebody. Making a difference is different than impressing somebody. And so much in our Christmas giving, in our trying to get gifts, that's what we're about, is impressing. You probably all got this flyer at your homes from Best Buy. Any employees from Best Buy here? <laughs> oh, my video guy. Good. I'm in trouble. <laughs> um, Okay, not to beat up. I mean, if this is their job, retail job at Christmas time. I don't, you know, begrudge them at all, but wrap up the wow. We got these cards that can make your wow list. And they're supposed to make your list of all the things you want to get, and you give to your family and say, if you give me these things, you'll wow me. But you know, when wow in our society means that PlayStation 3 for $600, how do you get someone a hula hoop for three bucks? You know? It just doesn't work. Because what we're trying to do with our gifts isn't make a difference in people's lives because we don't understand the needs are where we could make a difference. And we just try to impress people. We try to wow them. And however you found that you could wow them last year, well, all you did was amp up the ante, and next year, you got to wow them even bigger. And it's going to be hard. And I'm not sure you're still making a difference. The third thing that um, God shows us with how God gave the gift to Jesus is that God says, give yourself... Don't just give a thing. Give yourself, not just a thing. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall call him Emmanuel. Emmanuel. You know what Emmanuel means? It means God with us. God with us. God didn't just give us a thing. Not just a sign, not just something to hold on to. God said, you know, you guys, humanity is hurting. Humanity is lost without me. Humanity is afraid that they are going to be abandoned and that there's nowhere for them to go. And I don't want them to know that. In fact, if I, want, I need to go in there and be with them. I can't just tell them I have to be there for them. And if that means being born as the most lowly person on that planet, and in the, most, in the toughest conditions, if it means that take suffering the greatest things and let them know that no matter what the cost is to be, I will not forsake them. I will not forget them. I will not abandon them. Then I will do it. If it means dying on a cross for them to let them know that I will never forget them, then that's what I'll do. God didn't give us something. God gave himself to us in the person of Jesus. We're called to do the same thing. And that's how Matthew records it as he begins to tell the story. He says, and they shall... Name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. How do we do that, you know? It doesn't mean you don't give a gift, but that gift should speak of yourself. I know a story, of, it's, I know a man here in South Minneapolis who's a friend of mine. He's um, fairly old and not that healthy now, but he began his career long ago working for Hennepin County. He was in the records department and was um, the supervisor of this department. And some, about, let me, about 40 years ago, a young girl graduated from high school somewhere outstate Minnesota, rural Minnesota, moves to Minneapolis at 18 years old, gets a job in a job in his department in Hennepin County. Well, she didn't know up and down. She hadn't been, she hadn't been raised all the way yet. And she's still learning to deal with the city and everything. And so she found that her supervisor was more than someone to just help her at work, but he was willing to help her with kind of, you know, figuring out an apartment and getting life set up and things like that. Um, when it came to Christmas time, she had to work right up to Christmas noon, Christmas Eve noon, and could not get home. And so Bob and his wife invited her to his house um, to spend Christmas Eve and Christmas with them. That went on for years and years. Twenty-five years later, Bob retires. And his party, this woman comes and says, you know, you weren't just my boss. You were my second father. Because... I had a lot of growing up to do. And you were always there for me. Bob hadn't given her a present, but Bob was always present for her. He hadn't given her a thing. He had given him, he had given her himself for 25 years and how she needed it so that she could have those pieces of her life filled out. Give yourself not a thing. 
to think and speak for ourselves. If I give a gift to my wife or to my children or someone I love, and they know that I have been there for them, I understand them, and that this is an expression of that love that I've shown along, that's wonderful. But if I've been detached and unavailable and not understanding, and I give them something with all the clips in the world, they look at it and go, huh, so what? I would rather have had you than just this gift. See, one of the problems with giving gifts our way is that it just doesn't meet those things. It doesn't fit this idea that, you know, it doesn't understand that it's better to give than to get. It doesn't understand that gifts are supposed to make a difference. It doesn't understand that it needs to be about ourselves, not about something that we give somebody else. And so, you know, first of all, what can I tell you? When it comes to, is Christmas too expensive? And probably it's true for all of us. I can just see you guys all worried about those credit cards, you know, bills coming in at the end of January. If you are spending too much money on Christmas, then stop it, okay? Stop it. It isn't making Christmas okay. It doesn't make a perfect Christmas to spend all that money, so just stop it. And you, what you're doing is undermining your family for the future. You're going to be hurting yourself economically. You're going to be creating expectations for future years. It doesn't work. If you're spending too much money on Christmas, just stop it, okay? Now... The reason we keep doing that is because of the drive, the hustle, the bustle, the hectic. What else can we do? We don't have any other message. And that's when it's time to close your eyes and to remember that promise from 2,700 years ago. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel. Memorize that verse. It's at the top of your sheet this week. And when you find those times when you're just so busy, you need a different message, say that to yourself. And remember that the gift is Jesus. And how can you give gifts that are like that? By the way, if you're driving and you need to do that, don't close your eyes. All right? <laughs> keep them open and you can just say it a lot. Okay. A couple of myths that keep tripping us up. And they fit along with what we're just saying. I'll go through these quickly. First of all, um, a good gift costs money. No. A good gift does not cost money. There's a, a little bit from the movie Surviving Christmas. Let's take a look at this video and uh, it helps drive home the point better than I can make it. All right. Well, Miss Grinch, I know you're sophisticated, modern, and very jaded, and nothing gets to you. You have no uh, emotions. But I would be willing to bet, even you, before you got old, er, than you are now, but still, you know, as young and attractive and smart and beautiful how you are now. What is that? I don't know, like some moment in your childhood before everything got complicated when, when you were happy. I know you have, must have some moment in your life that's, that you'd like to go back and relive. Yeah. Yeah, I don't nine years old and we had just had this ice storm and I was walking home from school to Bishop Park and you know that one big oak tree in the middle it was completely frozen and all the branches were just icicles it was just it was it was incredible it completely stopped me in my tracks I just remember standing underneath it pretending that I was a princess in a magical crystal palace. It was really, it was
<laughs> I'm not disappointed, okay? I'm not mad. I'm just mad at myself for thinking that there was more to you than I thought. And that's you. It's a wrap. Save your big, expensive gestures for some girl who's impressed by them, all right? And when you find her, hold on to her. Because otherwise, you are looking at a lifetime of lonely Christmases. The money, everything you spend, all the whoopla, it is someone does it. It's something that comes from the heart. Now, a good gift doesn't necessarily cost money at all. The second myth is that spending money on someone else comes as giving yourself. You know, we all try it, and we will probably try it again sometime in our lives, but spending money does not, spending a lot of money doesn't mean that it came more from yourself. This is today's paper, I just love this. Uh, this morning I, I pulled out the source section, it's the wish list. It's a shopping guide. You open up to the middle section here, say I love you for under $100. <laughs> I can help you say I love you for under hundred dollars. Are you sitting next to someone that you love, at least platonically? Turn to them right now and say, I love you. Right. You just pay me 99 bucks, all right? Okay, spending a lot of money on someone does not mean um, that you are giving up yourself. And we need to realize that. This third one isn't maybe so easy. I might get in a little trouble for this one. But the last fill in there is that the people closest to me are the ones that I should give the most to. The people closest to me are the ones that I should give the most to. Now remember, these are myths. That's what we do. We spend all the money on the people that are closest to us, but God calls us to understand that we were intrinsically made to give and that we're supposed to be making gifts that make a difference and maybe that shouldn't be able to be repaid. And maybe the gifts that we have to give that will make a difference in people's lives aren't the people closest to us. Now, the people we are called to give to certainly include those closest to us, but they don't end with those that are closest to us, and they may not even start with the people closest to us. That can be hard to understand sometimes, but that is how God did it. Remember, this man comes up to Jesus and says, you know, I know that I'm supposed to love my neighbor as myself, but who is my neighbor? And Jesus tells him a story about a foreigner. God may have given you the gifts. God may have found, told you that the way that you will truly celebrate Christmas is by giving gifts to people that are not close to you. A question to ask when you're struggling with how to be gifting other people at Christmas is this question that's printed on your outline and it's on the screen here in a second. Ask yourself, am I giving from my heart to make a difference in the lives of others? If you do not understand how the gift that you are giving matches that, maybe it's the wrong gift. Maybe you're missing the person that God has asked you to give to that will help you find the magic of Christmas that you're so desperately trying to find. Now, you might say, you know, Greg, I agree with this. This all makes sense, but I, it just isn't going to wash. It's not going to fly in my family. We have expectations. Everyone else that I go to meet their relatives, they're going to think I'm nuts if I start doing this stuff. And you know what? You are absolutely right. Because... This is God's way of looking at things, not our way of looking at things. And that's the last villain. God's ideas about gifts only work where God's ideas are practiced. Write practice in there, then circle it. Because until you start practicing this as a family and as a person, this is going to be tough. We are not called to blend in and disappear into the, into the world around us, which perpetuates you know, the kind of Christmas you know, that Best Buy is perpetuating or that Macy's, or any of those others are perpetuating. We are called to be a contrast community, to teach a new way to the people around us, and to ourselves, and to our families. Until you begin practicing this, it's going to be tough, and there's going to be tension. So, some things to know. The culture changes slowly, so be patient. Take little steps. Do small things. Sit down with your family. Look at all the money that you're going to be spending on gifts this year and say, we're going to tie. That means we're going to take 10% of all that money that we would be spending on each other and we're going to do some alternative gifts with them. We're going to make a difference in someone's life in Africa or someone's life at a refugee here in Minneapolis or something like that. And we're going to see how that fits into our understanding of Christmas. Start with small things because culture changes slowly. 
Paul says, do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let God's understanding of gifts and what giving means start to change how you think and what you do. And do not be conformed to the world. So as you head into this hectic last couple of weeks before Christmas, and you just can't seem to center things, and you know you've got a wonderful Christmas and all the trappings, but there seems to be something missing. I encourage you to take those 10 seconds and to find the stillness, to find the quiet that is also so much a part of Christmas. And simply remember that line. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall call him Emmanuel. We're going to take our offering now. There's offering base on that side. And, uh, at the beginning of each set of uh, seats, just keep passing them over. Um, you can put in your offerings that you have in there and uh, your communication cards. If you're still filling something out and the bag comes to you, that's okay. Don't worry about it. You can slow down. You've got plenty of time. The band is going to sing us some music. And you're welcome to sing along with that as well. And uh, you've got some empty time there. You can memorize that verse in the top of your outline. Thanks so much.
join me in prayer. Lord, glide with these people. I fall so many things. Each and every one of us has worries. We have problems. We have members of our community who have lost a parent in the last couple of weeks. They're struggling with understanding, healing, and waiting for some sense to come from that. We have people dealing with their jobs. We have people dealing with their family. We have people dealing with their relationships. We ask that you be with them. They, too, need a sign. They need a sign that isn't dependent on how good they have, but a sign that you decided to give because it makes a difference in their life, and it is yourself. Help us to accept you. Help us to have these few weeks before Christmas. Allow us in a special way to get ready for you to come into our hearts and to transform our minds so that we aren't so conformed to this world and so stuck in its ruts, but we can have new ways, fresh ways, ways that no life can experience life. Pray for the ways that we are gifts to one another. Help each and every one of us to be your light and your love and your hope to the world around us. Let's join hands in these weeks and walk forward in that light. And show it to others as well. All this, Lord, we pray to you, knowing that our world needs so much. Not just us gathered here at this school, but the people in our community that surround us, so many that aren't here yet, that we know that you have called them as well. And in the larger community and in the world, there are people dying because they're waiting for us to take the gifts that we have been given and make a difference in the lives of them. Help them to hang on, give them hope, and help us to move to touch their lives as well. We pray this in the name of the Son, Jesus. The band is going to play a closing song. I invite you to, you can, um, you're welcome to leave during the song. It's sort of an exiting music. Uh, the H2O program for your children goes for another about seven or eight minutes, so you don't have to be in a hurry to go pick them up. Um, have a last cup of coffee or something and visit with some folks. I'll be up here in front. If anyone wants to talk to me about anything or some of the other launch team members, feel free to do that as well. But the goal this week, and you are going to be busy, you are going to get crazy busy at times, and so stop. Take that 10 seconds to remember that. Promise that Jesus didn't speak just to Ahaz and the people of Judah 2,700 years ago, but he spoke it to you today and tomorrow and the next day. Remember, therefore, God himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is a child that shall bear a son, and he shall be named Emmanuel. God is with you. Amen. Go in peace. See you next week.
stay. Would you mind?